Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi dostan. Good evening. Uh, my name is Buya Zadi. I'm the manager of Stanford Iran 2040 project. Um, before I introduce our greatest speaker tonight, uh, I would like to say a few words about uh, what we do for those of you who don't know what we do. Uh, so the Stanford Iran 2040 project is a hub for scholars around the world, especially the uh, Iranian diaspora scholars, to conduct fact-based, uh, forward-looking um, research on issues relating to um, Iran's uh, troubled economy um, and the future of the country. Um, the initiative was established in um, around mid-2016 um, and has been co-sponsored by the Hamid and uh, Christina Mogadam program in Iranian studies and the Freeman Spagli Institute for um, International Studies. So, so far we have had the opportunity to collaborate with nearly 30 um, uh, scholars with diverse backgrounds, uh, both within the Stanford community um, and beyond. Um, and among other activities, we have published four uh, working papers on Iran's uh, energy and agriculture sectors, as well as on Iran's uh, population, which is the uh, topic of tonight's um, talk. Um, and uh, so if you're interested in reading these papers, these are all available on our website. You can go and download and uh, read them. Uh, we also have three ongoing projects. Um, there, uh, one is on um, Iran's water crisis uh, and the outlook for food security uh, in Iran. Uh, second one is on the um, issues related to the challenges of the banking system in Iran. Uh, and the third one is um, an effort to depict a holistic view uh, <coughs> of the country uh, by creating a series of uh, interactive web pages um, or dashboards, each one presenting major uh, indicators for an important uh, pillar of the economy. Um, uh, we have so far made four such pages, so if you're interested, again, you can go to our website and check them. Uh, one of them is on macroeconomic indicators, um, the other one is on oil and gas and um, population, as well as international trade. Uh, so once all these Envision dashboards are made, uh, one can hopefully um, grasp uh, what has been going on in the country over the past uh, few decades and also um, kind of get an idea of how the country is going to look like um, in the future in a simple and uh, intuitive manner. Um, so with this said, um, um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our uh, greatest speaker tonight. Ms. Farzan Rudi, uh, who is a senior demographer and uh, policy analyst with more than 30 years of experience researching and writing on Middle Eastern population and development issues. Uh, she worked at the Population Reference Bureau from 1987 to 2016, where she initiated and directed PRB's uh, program for Middle East and North Africa, for the MENA region. Uh, she led policy communications training in the region and has written several policy briefs and articles, including for the United Nations and the European Union. Uh, she is the author or co-author of some of the most highly cited papers concerning Iran's and Middle East demographic matters. Over the past year, uh, we have had the honor and privilege uh, of collaborating with uh, Fazana Khanum, uh, the results of which uh, is a working paper uh, which has recently been published. Uh, it's on the website again. It's called Iran's Population Dynamics and uh, Demographic Window of Opportunity. Um, and uh, Farzan Ajan, I have to say that, has uh, spent an enormous amount of time uh, on this paper uh, for which we are profoundly uh, grateful. Uh, uh, so in this paper, if you read it, uh, we argue that uh, today uh, Iran's population uh, resembles a two-edged sword. Um, on the one hand, the rapidly expanding population um, has been linked to nearly every single problem uh, confronting the nation. Uh, unemployment, poverty, water scarcity, undernourishment, uh, urban pollution, and the soaring domestic use of energy. On the other hand, and on the positive side, the rise in the share of working age population and it, uh, can potentially serve as a driver for economic growth uh, and development. And this is exactly the topic of um, Farzana's presentation, which is entitled, Use It or Lose It, Iran's Demographic Window of Opportunity. Uh, Farzana Jan lives in Toronto, and uh, we are very thankful of her coming such a long distance uh, for giving this talk. So without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Farzana.
Thank you very much, Puyajan. Um, it was uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm delighted uh, to have this opportunity of uh, co co collaborating with the uh, Iranian Studies Program and also with Puya. Uh, it ha I learned a lot uh, from Puya, and uh, this is really a joint uh, research and joint work. What I'm pre presenting, it's a uh, work of all of us that worked on this uh, project. Uh, I want to tell you about Iran's population story. And I believe that this is something that for years to come, researchers are going to study it. Because what happened in Iran since the Iranian Revolution in regard to its population issues, in many aspects, it has been quite unique. The last census in Iran was conducted in t last year in 2016, showing that uh, the population uh, was near uh, close to 80 million, and three quarters of the people live in urban area. And the population uh, is growing at 1.2% per year, uh, which is uh, similar to world's average. But it's much, much higher than what it was, the rate that it was growing uh, around the t uh, revolution. And uh, between 19, the two censuses of 1976 and 86, the population was growing at close to 4% a year. Didn't you like to have your saving account have interest rate of 4%? <laughs> it's uh, one of the highest rate of growth uh, in the world. And that mostly because of natural increase the difference between the number of births and death. Uh, migration has also was a factor because it was uh, during uh, when uh, refugees from Afghanistan and the war with Iraq, uh, re Iraqi refugees were coming. Uh, but it was mostly because of natural increase that Iran had such a high rate of population growth. And this high rate of natural increase was partly because mortality was uh, declining, life expectancy was increasing, and that was ma mainly because infant and child mortality was declining rapidly. Um, you see the, the graph on the left, it shows the period that life expectancy for men, uh, it was um, dropped. That shows the period of uh, Iran-Iraq war. Um, the figure on the right shows uh, child mortality rate, rate, decline in child mortality rate uh, in Iran, that it was uh, around before the revolution or uh, by the time it was higher than, uh, uh, on average, it was higher than the world average. And now it's close, uh, the rate, the child mortality rate, it's more closer to more developed countries. For infant mortality rates, that's the uh, that of children before age one, is actually one fifth of the world's average. Iran's infant mortality rate is one fifth of world's average. And while Mortality was declining so fast. Uh, infant and child mortality was declining so fast. Uh, still, fertility rate was high. And uh, 
in the 70s, 80s, on average, women were giving birth to uh, more than like six children. And uh, but when the results of 1996, uh, 1996 census were coming out, uh, Iran surprised the world how fast, how fast its fertility declined and how fast uh, its population growth was declining. Um, I remember when uh, the results of 1996 uh, census were coming out, my aunt from Iran was sh sending me some numbers from the results. And then I shared it with my colleague uh, at Population Reference Bureau. At Population Reference Bureau, every year we were putting out um, a wall chart for like 80 years in a row that all the demographic uh, data for the countries, basic demographic uh, data, uh, in, wall, in one wall chart for the world. And I was telling him about Iran's new data. And he was say, telling me, no, the, you only talk to a special group of Iranians, so that's not true. And at the time, there was no internet or anything. And after a while, United Nations newsletters uh, were coming in, into our library. And it had a small, a few lines about Iran's, uh, the new results from the census. And then he was accepting that, uh, OK, these are the data, but Iranians lie. These are not correct. And I said, why should they lie about their numbers? And then my own supervisor was the head of the international program. She was uh, telling, and then it, the data also was showing high rate of contraceptive use and all. They said that they force women to wear a hijab, so they force women to use contraception. And I was laughing, and I said, no, Iranian women, you cannot force them. Anyway, it took him four years before he, uh, the person who was in charge of this world population data sheet, uh, it took him four years to accept to publish the Iranian data. It was how surprising. Uh, even for the Iranians, it was surprising. So I got interested. I was wanted to go to Iran and see it for myself <coughs> as what happened. And uh, July 11 is World Population Day. So for two, three years in a row, I went uh, in the summer for to be there you know, for July 11. So to see the activities that Iranians were involved around World Population Day. And uh, I want to, uh, all this uh, decline in uh, mortality, it was all in every age group that um, um, and um, this is the pattern, uh, this is a snapshot of uh, fertility rates by age groups. And if when a um, girl is born and survive to uh, her reproductive age and go through this pattern of fertility, then this is how we calculate total fertility rate. And that's a, a age standardized. That's why um, it's a useful uh, indicator for comparative purposes. And um, Um, so it's a measure that uh, we can use to compare uh, fertility levels at the, 
across countries. And when we put uh, total fertility versus uh, GDP per capita for countries, we see that Iran falls in the group of Eurasian countries that generally relatively low at the lower end of uh, GDP per capita, mm -hmm. but lower fertility also. We see the African countries, they are high, uh, higher fertility and lower income. And uh, like European countries are more uh, lower fertility, but uh, variety of uh, level of, levels of income. The Middle Eastern countries um, are all over because of their economy and also differences in uh, fertility. So in a way, for the Middle East, at least, Iran stands out. And this rapid fertility, this is a record decline. The speed of decline, experience that, uh, fertility decline that Iran uh, experienced uh, is a record. And it did it without coercion or abortion. Like China, one child policy, or Turkey or Tunisia, uh, abortion is legalized and uh, it's publicly, the services are available uh, publicly. Uh, but Iran did it mainly through uh, education, family planning services. Of course, illegal abortion is there, and everybody knew it. In my first trips to Iran, I uh, asked women uh, about abortion and how much. The interesting thing was that I was hearing the same price from different sources. <laughs> so that uh, was... So overall, there has been four turning points in Iran's fertility policy. And uh, first, before the revolution in 1967, during Shah, they uh, established family planning program as part of a country's development plan. And the imperial government of Iran uh, launched the family planning program through the, the Ministry of Health. And um, the 1967 Tehran Declaration acknowledged family planning as a human right and uh, emphasized in its social and economic benefits for families and society. And they trained uh, a cadre of uh, professional uh, staff. And, um, taught many young, uh, young doctors about the benefits of family planning uh, for family and society. And, uh, but by 1979, uh, with the Islamic Revolution, actually in first days after the revolution, uh, they dismantled the program. They see it as family planning as a Western innovation. And because of its connection to royal family, uh, they dismantled it. But the doctors in the Ministry of Health, uh, some doctors were quick to go to Ayatollah Khomeini and get a fatwa about the permission to have uh, contraception that it's uh, not forbidden in Islam. And uh, Ayatollah Khomeini gave uh, its uh, okay that, uh, yeah, they can, uh, I mean, there is no contradiction between Islam and family planning. And um, as long as uh, the woman, I mean, the husband is, uh, knows about it. Um, but, uh, and then uh, shortly after the revolution, uh, Iraq attacked Iran, and Iran was involved with eight year of war. And during the war, of course, in 
people are more, uh, I mean, the officials, I should say, uh, that uh, they were more into uh, pronatalist and uh, uh, propaganda of having more people, uh, uh, larger population would be better. One of the quotes from Ayatollah Khomeini was that uh, our soldiers uh, are, are in their cribs, and uh, Saddam Hussein was telling its people that be bearing a child is an arrow in the eye of uh, an enemy. And uh, also, this new Islamic government, they were, had some social benefits to larger families. So there were some implicit uh, policies that was encouraging uh, uh, families to have, uh, I mean, in families uh, with more children to get more benefits to it. And when the population was uh, growing so fast, uh, um, and then when the war ended, and they wanted, uh, they focused on the reconstruction of the country, uh, they started to gather data. Uh, the war ended in 88, and the results of the census were coming out, uh, showing such a high rate of population growth. Some of the elementary schools had to go to three, two or three shifts because they didn't have the capacity and the Ministry of uh, Health and Agriculture, they were coming and saying that we had revolution in order for uh, to be people to be uh, kind of, uh, we didn't want to Im import uh, food from outside the country. So they were building a kind of the whole uh, informing the higher level of the government about this rapid population growth that was uh, as a barrier to a econ country's economic uh, growth. So by 1989, the government changed its, its policy, and they say that now we have family planning program as a way of reigning in uh, the rapid population growth. And until a few years ago, they had this policy, one of the most successful uh, family planning programs, uh, until uh, like uh, during Ahmadinejad, since 2006, he has started to talk about uh, you know, this whole idea uh, of uh, slowing population growth. We need to have, uh, Iran has capacity for more population. And the debate, the talk about uh, started around uh, Ahmadinejad and officially since 2012, uh, again, the government changed its policies. And by 2014, actually supreme leaders Population Policy Directive, that, which is now the official uh, Iran's population policy that encourages um, has uh, to have fa for families to have more children. During, uh, sorry. <laughs> When in the uh, 90s that uh, the population um, um, that the government has this uh, wanted to control the population, so th there was a whole uh, movement as at every level, at the policy level, and also from grassroots. In my visits 
that's how I felt everybody was into it, that, pop, uh, that the country has population problem and uh, they were, population was growing rapidly. And these are some of the posters that they were, I'm, I'm going to show you, uh, that they were showing as, um, it, they were always connecting it, uh, this population with the country's uh, economic and uh, the society's uh, well-being. And uh, like this poster was saying, uh, fewer children, better education. And generally, the, law, uh, the theme for them was that uh, better uh, life with uh, fewer children and girl or boy, uh, two is enough. And. Um, The two posters on the left, I took this picture at the uh, ministry, um, provincial office of Ministry of Health in Shiraz, and uh, the poster on the top, uh, the two girls uh, sitting um, with, had written things on the poster, uh, the same messages that uh, to, to girl or boy two is enough. But the one uh, underneath is about the importance of daily prayer. By putting these two uh, posters next to each other, they were wanted to imply to people that there is no contradiction between Islam and uh, family planning. And uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, this picture I happened uh, to work uh, in a circle in uh, Shiraz that uh, it was saying population control reigns in illiteracy and unemployment. And <clears throat> one of the things that they did, uh, they instituted uh, family planning classes that it was required for couples, both for men and women, who wanted to get married. Before they get their license, a uh, marriage license, they were required to uh, take uh, these family planning classes. And I s went and sa sat down to, in some of these classes in Tehran, in Mashhad, and in Esfahan. Some of them um, in Tehran, uh, the, this prospective husband and uh, wives, they were sitting next to each other in the class. And uh, in Esfahan, I was saying one, men were in one side and women on the other side. In Mashhad, it was totally separate. Men separate uh, in separate room and uh, women in a separate room. I remember it was in Mashhad that uh, the instructor was asking the young women uh, how many children you want to have. And they were saying uh, two or one or three. One uh, woman, one girl said uh, four. And the instructors uh, told her, why do you want four? Do you want our country to become like India, that uh, people uh, sleep in the streets? And you should first uh, think of the quality of your children, how well you can attend to them, and all this. Uh, and this picture is uh, in uh, one of those classes in Tehran, actually. Uh, and the messages that is written messages behind the woman there um, is all about fewer children in improvement of their economic and social advances. There is nothing, I don't want to, uh, even though that was achieved, the reproductive health of women, improving reproductive health of women. But all the messages is about family and society. Uh, so that made it less sensitive to talk about reproductive health issues, which is understandable within Iran's um, kind of conservative uh, mentality, uh, particularly for officials to let this, such a program uh, continue. Uh, but overall, the goal was 
the women themselves were not the target. The improvement of uh, health of women is, was not that much the target. It was how many children they have or uh, and the society, which was fine. At the end, the result, uh, uh, women gained their reproductive rights, and that's maybe why we see more women in the streets as they had the experience of having their reproductive rights, now they want more rights. Uh, and uh, we see that Iranian women are quite active. And uh, Iran's family planning program was successful because of its uh, rural health network system. Uh, which is a model, uh, recognized as a model by World Health Organization. Um, actually, in my first trip that I went to Iran, I had the opportunity to, uh, it happened by accident, meet uh, Dr. Shatpur, a senior uh, official from Ministry of Health, and he was extremely helpful to me. Of telling me about what, uh, how their system uh, was working. And um, he was one of the minds behind the design of this pr uh, uh, primary health care in Iran and uh, rural health system. In the 70s, uh, there was this international uh, Called the World Health Organization had this uh, a movement to have primary health care, uh, make it universal. As part of that, Iran kind of was involved, wanted to be involved in that. They had as a pilot project in Urumiye uh, to have a health house uh, designed as a, the lowest level of health care. Uh, in the that the way that they were uh, looking at the services, what services it was needed at the very lowest, and uh, they thought that it was thirteen uh, can cover thirteen hundred people. Someone who with six years of uh, schooling and after two years of training would be able to. Uh, serve in these health houses, and usually one man and one woman. Uh, one woman, the woman would be in charge of maternal health, um, maternal and child health, and the man would be more in charge of the uh, like water safety, environmental issues, and uh, agriculture. In this picture, this is uh, I believe it was in Isfahan. Uh, that I took, and uh, it happens that these are two women in a rural health house. And the charts behind them that you see, uh, these are called Zija Hayati, uh, that's very simple design of uh, the charts that keeps track of the number of people that they serve, their age groups, Children are born, uh, they are vaccinated, if they died, uh, what was the cause of death. So at any moment, you have all the statistics in front of you. And uh, about the um, population situation, the health, I mean, uh, the services that these health houses, they were responsible. And um, When um, a colleague of mine, I, I went to Iran with an Egyptian colleague of mine who was uh, with UNFPA, United Nations uh, Fund for Population Activity, because he got, she got also interested and she wanted to see it for herself as what happened uh, in Iran. And when we went to Iran, we wanted to go to uh, provinces that are less um, developed, and so it happened that we chose, uh, to, we went to Elam, 
and uh, we went to this uh, University of Elam. And one of the things um, I just say here, uh, Iran is also unique. It, they did it some years after the revolution that they put medical education and Ministry of Health together. Uh, so each province would be in charge of uh, training, producing all the doctors and medical staff to serve their province. Uh, so they were responsible so, uh, for their own. So that's why usually, uh, and each province at least had one university, medical uh, university. And so we went to this uh, university in Elam. That's a, pro a province next to Iraq. Uh, we were not too far from Iraq border. And they put in front of us a list of uh, health houses there. And uh, they said we wanted to go and look at two different, two health houses. They didn't choose for us because they thought that if they choose for us, they, we would think that they want to showcase it, uh, some special one. They put a list and we chose two and we went and saw these um, health houses. Uh, one of them, it was these two, oh, these health workers in the health house uh, called Behvars. Uh, and uh, this vocabulary behvars is becoming more and more accepted as a, in international uh, terminology for public health. Um, and the guy is actually one of the first behvars in Iran from Shahstan, from before the revolution. And um, my friend, Maha, uh, my Egyptian friends, she is a medical uh, doctor, she, was, she understood uh, this medical, I'm a demographer, so. Uh, she kept on asking, do you have this or that? And he was uh, bringing and showing to her about uh, what uh, the things that they, they had in uh, uh, the clinic. Uh, one of the things in health house, it's all over the country. It con consists of two rooms and all over Iran, the size of t these two rooms is exactly a square foot and the same. And the materials, the things, the equipments that are there are exactly the same. So it's uniform. But from outside, they, uh, are different. I mean, they look the same as other houses uh, in the village. And Iran, uh, the rural population is very spread out. And uh, like in 1996, there were 68,000 villages in Iran with average population of uh, 340 uh, people. So each health house had covering more than one uh, village. In rural, uh, in, uh, rural areas, these uh, workers uh, in uh, health houses, they are proactive, they are local, they know uh, people, so they are comfortable going knocking at the door. Uh, of uh, houses, but that was not, that's not the case in urban areas. So in order to fill in this gap, they, uh, in urban areas, um, if people would come to the clinic, come, but the health workers wouldn't approach uh, people uh, for services. Uh, they started to have women volunteers, Zanane uh, Rabit, as 
And uh, these are, uh, as a volunteer, women uh, in neighborhood, different neighborhoods. They assigned uh, up to 50 households that um, they know their neighborhood and they make uh, local, um, um, they make uh, files in the clinic uh, for the, uh, the families and like if they have uh, children, newborn, they would come and have vaccination and all this. And one of also another significant part of Iran's family planning program was uh, uh, this issue that Iran do uh, allow vasectomy. And uh, this is a clinic uh, in Shahre Rey that they were training uh, vasectomy. And uh, they were very uh, keen about counseling. They were saying that if someone uh, one of these, um, their clients are, are not happy and go talk uh, kind of against the vasectomy. Uh, so would other people wouldn't come. So they were very keen about uh, doing the counseling before that. And Iran had uh, has condom factory, which is uh, so. Um, Iran has uh, the largest population of, uh, with HIV and AIDS in the Middle East. AIDS is a big issue in Iran. And this picture is from during Khatami, when it was open. It was World AIDS Day. It happens that was a poster about World AIDS Day. And I actually, it's a Maidan Ferdowsi. It happens that I was passing by there. It's. Uh, uh, the message there is about safe sex and uh, use of a condom and all this. Anyway, all these, it raised the uh, contraceptive use in the country. Uh, percent of w uh, women using contraception in Iran is similar to United States. Yeah. Uh, and one of the other achievements is that was that modern contraceptive use in rural and urban areas uh, is pretty much similar, and even maybe a, a bit higher in rural areas. In rural areas, between 1976 and 2000, uh, fertility declined from like eight children per woman to 2.5 children per woman. In, in just one generation, such a drastic change from a bit more than eight to 2.5. For European countries, for such decline, it took them like a, a 300 years. So how society has changed in Iran is uh, by the year 2000, most of provinces in Iran, they were at uh, around replacement level. Replacement level is like around two births per woman that she replaces herself and uh, her husband um, or below. Only Sistan and Baluchistan uh, were um, had uh, more fertility had fertility of more than three children per woman, which uh, we don't uh, still have uh, fertility rates uh, for 2016 uh, from the census data uh, for Iran, but we have the age distribution by province, that uh, we can use this as proxy indicator uh, to show differences in the level of fertility among uh, countries, among provinces, sorry. And uh, still, uh, it's, uh, Sistan and Baluchistan has the highest uh, percent uh, of its population, um, children uh, under 15. And um, 
Gilan uh, as the lowest, uh, which TFR uh, at in 2011 was like 1.3 births per woman. Does that correspond to um, urban rural divide and population densities? This one or what? No, no, which the previous one. But also this one. I'm sorry, I cannot hear you well. Uh, does that correspond to an urban rural divide and also population densities? Not urban rural. Uh, 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 what what corresponds? As in the, the fertility rates. As in, is the fertility rate lower in the cities compared to the countryside? Um, still, rural areas are higher, but the differences were very close. Uh, not as much. Actually, the latest that's available. Uh, was that showing um, 1.8 for urban and 2.5 for, for rural. Yeah, 1.8 for urban and 1.7, 1.8 for urban and uh, 2.5 for rural. And that's partly also the age at marriage place because in rural area they marry younger and urban areas they marry a bit older. So this fertility decline which was mainly came because couples they um, um, and practice family planning had a significant impact on uh, age composition of the population. Um, in 1986, nearly half of uh, Iran's population were children, were 46% uh, were below age 15. And uh, by 2016, it uh, became like half, 24%. Uh, and uh, it's projected that by 2040, it will be 18. But then at the same time, the population is aging. And uh, by 2020, one in five Iranians will be uh, 65 years old and over. Uh, and which brings it a population kind of relatively uh, close to U.S. U.S. is uh, now uh, like 19 percent of uh, its population under age 15 and 15 percent of population uh, uh, 65 and over. And uh, also kind of uh, somewhere between Japan and uh, US. Uh, but for Iran, this now such a huge portion of its population is in working age. Uh, so this, this is the window of opportunity. This is now, uh, it has um, like three quarters, uh, uh, two thirds of its population is in working age group. And uh, how well, how they participate in the economy and uh, now that's uh, the key if um, this window, uh, demographic window of opportunity can be turned into dividend, demographic dividend. Um, this is the latest data on labor force participation and on employment that uh, we have from Iran. And uh, that's from summer of uh, 2016, uh, which showed that 
40% of 10 years and older, they were in the labor force. Uh, it meant that they had a job or they were looking for a job. And uh, there were not much difference between rural and urban, but between male and female, there was a huge difference. And this is, these are official statistics. So, and um, some believe that women's labor force participation could be higher than uh, this. But all these numbers are official from uh, uh, a statistical center uh, of Iran. Um, so out of this 40 percent, 13 percent are unemployed, are the ones uh, who uh, are uh, looking for a job. Even though th this is a kind of underestimate because uh, the definition is that um, when they do the survey, the week before the survey, if they were working, um, they ask if the w a week before survey they were working. And if not, uh, or looking for a job. But it doesn't, uh, so it doesn't uh, take into account those who gave up because the job market is so bad that they gave up and they are were not uh, looking uh, for a job. And uh, in urban areas, um, unemployment is about twice as high as uh, uh, rural areas partly because uh, unemployment is higher among more educated population and the more educated population are generally are in the rural areas and uh, women are twice or more than twice uh, likely to be unemployed and um, actually despite low labor force participation of women one third of unemployed in Iran are women. And um, about 60% of unemployed are youth between the ages of 15 and 29. So it makes it double whammy for women, young women, to be young and uh, to be women in the labor force. 44% of uh, women aged 15 to 29 were unemployed. Uh, but women's education, women are increasingly coming into labor force because as they are uh, increasingly for the past two decades, actually there are more women entering into university than men, and uh, this um, the bar graph on the right shows the data for uh, 2016, showing that women uh, have the majority in uh, all the fields except engineering, and uh, particularly in medicine and basic science. Uh, like 65% and 69% of uh, students enrolled in higher education uh, in these fields, medicine and basic sciences uh, are women. And uh, another trend that we see in uh, education uh, in Iran is that um, both men and women generally, they stay, stay in school longer and continue to go for higher degrees. To get, and that can be partly because of the job market when they cannot find a job, maybe staying in school. Uh, they are hoping that if with higher degree they uh, would improve their chance of uh, finding a job or just buying time until they find a, a job. Uh, but in all, uh, the number of educated population in Iran has grown rapidly. Between 1990 and 2016, like almost four 
um, the number of students enrolled in higher education in, increased almost by four million. And we know about Danishka Azad, open, the open university in Iran, that one of the largest universities uh, in the world. Um, humanity, about uh, 46% of all the students enrolled in higher education were in, enrolled in uh, the field of human, humanities and 30% uh, engineer. And internationally, Iran ranked fifth in the number of recent graduates in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, a STEM subject. Uh, ranked fifth in the world after China, India, USA, Ru and Russia which all of these countries have much larger population than Iran. And not surprisingly, again, actually last week, uh, some data on unemployment was coming out showing uh, that uh, those with bachelor degree have the highest rate of unemployment in Iran, because there are so many of them now. The more uh, there are more uh, Ir uh, Iran has more educated people, so they are coming uh, to the labor market that cannot absorb them much. So we see higher unemployment among uh, more educated population. But wouldn't it be correct to add those four millions as the unemployed? Because as a matter of fact, people are just exactly yeah. Yes. Exactly. We went with the uh, uh, official definition of unemployment and uh, what the Statistical Center of Iran uh, gathered. Uh, but it definitely, when you talk to the people, and uh, yeah, uh, those and uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, m many of them would, uh, for sure, if they had a job, they would have preferred to have a job. Yeah. Uh, this is a um, projection, kind of, uh, Dr. Azadi uh, produced this uh, chart uh, showing how uh, this population age pyramid, uh, Iran's population age pyramid by uh, educational attainment. Um, the red is uh, illit uh, those who are Ill illiterate. Uh, we can see that from 2006, 2016, uh, and projection for uh, 2026 based on the trends that has been seen. Uh, between the uh, in the uh, past years, um, um, illiteracy is uh, almost eradicated among youth, and uh, the gray part of the pyramid are those uh, with primary, secondary, and uh, associate degrees, uh, which is like uh, for a diploma. Uh, and the greenish uh, are bachelors and higher. By 2016, the age group uh, 25 to 34, half of them will have bachelor's degree. As in for later years, then this will go higher and higher if the trends the way it is uh, continue. Um, so going back to Iran, the age structure of Iran's, this age pyramid shows by five-year age groups and sex, and we see that 
uh, this bulge now, 2016, how much of this bulge is in the working age uh, group? And it all, uh, again, this is the window of opportunity for Iran, has educated population, relatively healthy, and uh, to put them in work. So if everything equal by the virtue of having larger portion of population in working age, that raises per capita income. Uh, and the more of these young, uh, these people working and the higher paid jobs that they do, uh, <clears throat> this will uh, stimulate the economy. And, um, but this is a window, this demographic, uh, the age structure that uh, uh, is not, it's uh, transitory. Um, and uh, the line bar on the left uh, it get, shows uh, the changes in uh, population size in absolute numbers for the working age, 15 to 64, and then the children, the blue line uh, under age 15, that it goes up and down, a kind of uh, showing that uh, you see here we have women in their reproductive age. We have higher, larger portion of women in their reproductive years. So, so it uh, goes, even though the same level of fertility uh, for women, but uh, the number of births uh, uh, fluctuate, changes. <clears throat> and, um, but we know that uh, 65 and over is gonna increase. But then the population 15 to 64 is start in mid 2040s, it starts to decline. And uh, um, that's um, So the, the age dependency ratio, um, the age dependency ratio, which is the ratio of the uh, elderly and children to the working age, now is at the bottom. I mean, the lowest uh, we can get, which is about half, uh, which is like 0.45. And, and then it is down from uh, 1990, it was close to one. Uh, but then in, uh, it's gonna go, but uh, as uh, the working age population is gonna decline and the uh, elderly population de uh, ri um, increases, this age dependency ratio again uh, gets higher. Um, so, with fewer uh, dependent, this Iran is is in the midst of its demographic uh, opportunity and has the potential for rapid economic growth, growth if its large and educated labor force is uh, going to be is able to. Uh, compete in a global market and uh, be employed. So this uh, demographic dividend uh, framework came about uh, from uh, 1980s when uh, this Asian economies, tiger Asian economies, uh, they were known as uh, tiger economies, uh, like Taiwan, South Korea, uh, Singapore and 
Thailand, all these, they had uh, an economic boom, that these changes in age structure was, uh, was uh, a factor in their uh, economic growth. And then uh, this uh, demographic dividend is not something automatic. Uh, things, uh, the health, education, governance, uh, economy, some elements, some synergy among this it should be present uh, for, uh, to reap this demographic window of opportunity. And uh, so this is my last slide to uh, kind of summarize things about uh, how Iran's, uh, harnessing Iran's demographic dividend. It's one-time opportunity. And l Iran use it or lose it. This, that you have such a huge portion of uh, population in working age, educated, and uh, <clears throat> just creating an uh, economy that to absorb them. Uh, actually, in a, this recent article uh, or some on BBC, uh, an analysis of that, I heard uh, that uh, President, uh, there are more than a million uh, new entrant to the job market Iran has currently. And since Rouhani came, was able to create 400 new jobs a year. So you see how wide the gap is uh, uh, for this. So in theory, this there is this first and second demographic uh, dividend. The first one is referred to mainly the changes in the age structure. Just by itself, you have more people in the working age working or whatever the level of everything equal in concerning uh, um, how much they are paid or how many of them are working, it raises per capita income and uh, grows the economy. But the second demographic dividend is possible if these young people, there are more of them are working and they are working in a well-paid job and because they can save and not only for their retirement and also into the economy. They can, so it's more durable and um, sustainable. And at the end, it all uh, goes to creating jobs, jobs, jobs in Iran. And uh, I think that's, yeah, what happens, <laughs> it all depends. And in the next uh, decade or two, uh, there is, uh, it's very urgent and immediate. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>